Many believe that democracy is about elections. That is not entirely wrong. After all, dictatorships do not have elections. Or at least not free, fair and contested elections. But is that all? Once a government is elected into office after free, fair and contested elections, does it end there? Once elected, is a government free to do as it pleases until the next election? The answer is no. In democracies, governments answer for their actions. In other words, they're accountable. A variety of principles help ensure government accountability in democracies. I will mention three of them. The first principle I will mention is the rule of law. That is, nobody is above the law and everyone operates within the confines of the law. That includes the government, law enforcement, bureaucracy, private citizens, everyone. But what if the government or some other actor arguably violates the law? In that case, the courts decide whether there really is a violation. Hence the need for an independent judiciary. Because courts must make decisions on their own and without the influence of the government. Otherwise, the judiciary will not be able to protect citizens from the government or to declare government bills and policies unconstitutional. The second principle is to encourage and maintain a strong civil society, which refers to the sum of private organizations that operate independently of the government, yet still have an influence on social and political outcomes. Primary examples to such organizations include advocacy groups, think tanks, humanitarian organizations, the media, religious organizations, and universities. Democracies encourage a strong civil society because in a democracy, citizens don't just vote every few years and then leave everything to the government. To the contrary, many citizens participate on a regular basis in a variety of ways. They monitor the government. They try to influence policy. They join forces with like-minded others to make a difference. They try to bring about change. So, while political institutions check on and balance each other, civil society organizations help disperse power further by checking on political institutions from the outside. Relatedly, the third principle is the freedom of the media. This principle is important because a democracy will be deficient if citizens are not well informed. But we cannot rely on the government to inform citizens of its own actions. We need sources outside of the government. That is, free and independent media organizations that investigate critical issues and report their findings without any fear of backlash. Without the freedom of the media, without the free flow of information from journalists to the general public, citizens will have to form their opinions with inadequate, if not false, information. Therefore, civil rights observers are deeply concerned when journalists are intimidated, threatened, prosecuted, or jailed. When that happens, one major force that helps ensure government accountability is crippled. These three are some of the core principles that are crucial to any democracy. Now, I would like to turn to Canada specifically and focus on some of the rules and conventions that help ensure government accountability in the country. I will focus on the question period primarily, but before that, it may be a good idea to mention some of the distinguishing characteristics of British-style parliaments. The British Parliament has a confrontational design. Here, in the House of Commons of the United Kingdom, the government and the opposition sit facing each other. The parliaments of Canada, Australia and New Zealand also have the same confrontational design as they are modeled after the British Parliament. This is the House of Commons of Canada, very similar in design and color. The Speaker of the House sits on the raised chair in the middle. 
the government sits to the right of the speaker and the opposition sits on the other side of the floor. There's usually more than one opposition party in the House, but the opposition party with the largest number of seats is called the official opposition, and its leader, the leader of the opposition. The official opposition has a set of formalized roles that are designed to keep the government in check. For example, the official opposition forms a shadow cabinet composed of its own MPs. Each member of the shadow cabinet, or each shadow minister, watches a particular ministry and scrutinizes its actions. Also, two of the standing committees in the parliament are always chaired by an opposition member. Also, as the Rideau Hall is the official residence of the Governor General of Canada, and as 24 Sussex is the official residence of the Prime Minister of Canada, Stornoway is the residence of the Leader of the Opposition. Also, the Prime Minister consults with the Leader of the Opposition on critical matters and key appointments. The Leader of the Opposition has special speaking privileges in the House. Also, in the Parliament, there are 22 opposition days that occur at the rate of approximately one per week. On these days, all opposition parties question the government on topics of their own choosing, and the government answers these questions. All of these arrangements help call the government to account for its actions. But none of these comes close to the question period in terms of popularity. On each sitting day in the House of Commons, opposition leaders and other MPs ask questions to the Prime Minister and other cabinet members. As you see, the Speaker is up on the raised chair. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau is sitting in the first row on the right side of the Speaker or on the left side of your screen. Right across from him, only a few meters away, is Andrew Scheer, the leader of the opposition. Sitting with Justin Trudeau are the members of the cabinet, and those with Andrew Scheer are the members of the shadow cabinet. The question period lasts 45 minutes and starts with a question by the leader of the opposition. Wow. Oral questions. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, the ongoing diplomatic crisis between Canada and China continues, and now it's Canadian canola producers who are paying for this Prime Minister's weakness on the world stage. It's clear that China has no respect for this Prime Minister, and why would they? After clowning around in India and backing down to Donald Trump time and time again, they believe they can walk all over him. China has unfairly jailed two Canadians, and now they're blocking canola exports. When will the Prime Minister finally stand up? for Canadian interests. Right on. If this sounded to you more like an attack than a question, you may be right. The question period is confrontational. The opposition attacks and the government defends itself. That is all normal. Still, some of my students who watch a question period for the first time are a bit puzzled by the harshness of the opposition. Some students even characterize such negative behavior toward the Prime Minister as anti-Canadian, most probably due to their high school education. But the leader of the opposition is actually doing the most Canadian thing, or the most British thing. After all, the British system involves making the Prime Minister and other cabinet members answer for their actions. Prime Minister. These hardships are affecting our canola farmers and indeed uh, uh, producers out west. That's why we've been on this issue for the past number of weeks, uh, including in many, many meetings with uh, various producers, uh, while we keep up our diplomatic efforts to resolve uh, this difference with China. We're going to continue to stand up for Canadian producers, can it, can it continue to stand up for Canadian farmers, and we will have good news to announce just in the next few days. The leader of the opposition. At first view, the House may look out of order. MPs on both sides of the floor applaud their leaders and loudly express disapproval when their opponents are talking. It appears chaotic, but it isn't. 
there are codes of conduct and none of what you just saw is actually against these codes of conduct. To the contrary, there's a long tradition behind the way the MPs react to their peers. This is just how the British tradition has ritualized conflict in the House of Commons, and the MPs act in accordance with that ritual. And when doing so, the MPs abide by a set of rules. For example, in case you haven't noticed, the MPs never address each other. They always address the speaker. Now let's watch the second question and answer with this new information in mind. Well, Mr. Speaker, we're finally making some progress. After the events of this weekend, the Prime Minister at least knows which country we're talking about in Asia. But not only is he not standing up for Canadian interests, he's actually bankrolling Chinese foreign policy by supporting the Asian Infrastructure yeah. Bank. That's 256 million taxpayer dollars to curry favour with a government that has jailed Canadians for political reasons and is in violation of international trade rules. So why is the Prime Minister using Canadian tax dollars to bankroll the foreign policy of the government of China? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Speaker, as part of the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, Canada joins countries such as Australia, France, Germany, India, Italy, South Korea and the UK in promoting inclusive global economic growth. Time of rising global trade tension, uh, the Conservative leader suggests as we close our doors to international cooperation. But well, we know that the bank can support lean, clean, green infrastructure in investments throughout Asia. To date, the only AIIB investment in China has been to reduce air pollution from the use of coal. We believe in Canadian leadership around the world. You just saw some more attacks and some more responses to these attacks. But the two leaders never addressed each other directly. They addressed the speaker. So there are rules, and the rules are observed. Nevertheless, MPs are human beings, and they too make mistakes every now and then. To make sure that we protect our industry in an appropriate fashion. We've set an aggressive timeline to do so. We are looking at multiple measures that we think can be in support of the industry, and we will firmly be in support of that industry as we move through this process. Honorable member for Essex. The one thing you could have done, you didn't. Well, another day in Ottawa and another way Liberals are disrespecting the independence of our... I have to, of course, remind the Honorable member to direct your comments to the chair. And when she says you, I think she's referring to me. Order. The Honorable member for Essex has the floor. After the leader of the opposition asks three questions, other opposition leaders ask their questions to the Prime Minister and other cabinet members. Finally, other MPs ask questions. This was the British system, roughly. These measures help British-style democracies keep the government in check. In other countries, they have different arrangements. For example, in Germany, there's an online portal for citizens to submit questions. So in Germany, you don't even have to be a member of the parliament to ask questions through the government. In the United States, the separation of powers system involves a strict separation between the legislative and executive branches. The White House is sort of like the Canadian cabinet. And the Congress is sort of like the Canadian parliament, but it assembles in a separate building and those in the White House are not among its members. So the American system balances the power of the government and keeps its actions in check in a different way. And it doesn't really matter. What matters is the extent to which a political system can hold the government accountable. What procedures are followed to achieve that is less important. Because the main difference between a dictatorship and a democracy is not elections. It is accountability to the people or their representatives. That is especially true since the turn of the millennium. Elected strong leaders in illiberal democracies around the world are increasingly the rule rather than the exception. Even in the European Union. People being the bosses of their leaders is an ideal that has yet to be fully achieved. Allow me to illustrate with an example. 
The Parliament Building in Ottawa is open to visitors. Domestic and international tourists visit its two chambers and go up the Peace Tower to see the city from above. There are even yoga classes on the front lawn from mid-spring until late summer in case you're interested. But some visitors, who are not that familiar with British-style parliaments, go inside the House of Commons, see the Speaker's chair, and think that the Prime Minister of Canada sits there. People are quite accustomed to imagining leaders on raised platforms, but that is not what a democracy is about. If you want a dictatorship, fine, then put the leader up there on the race platform and keep looking up. But if you want a democracy, the leader needs to be placed on the floor and held accountable. Dictatorships are called dictatorships for a reason. In a dictatorship, the leader dictates. In a democracy, the leader answers.